The new Toyota Land Cruiser has been a smash hit since the touchdown in late 2021, and there's not many big SUVs that can match it off-road. But what about on the road? Given that most owners will spend most of their time on sealed roads, let's see how it fares against a newer, bigger competitor from the US of A, the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. Who will be king on the road? Let's find out. The Toyota Land Cruiser needs no introduction, having cemented its place in Australian motoring history after more than 70 years of service. Based on an all new ladder frame that gives it go anywhere ability, the latest 300 series is the biggest and priciest Toyota sold in Australia. And this Sahara model on test cost a smidge over $130,000. The all new Jeep Grand Cherokee L arrived down under in May 2022 in long wheelbase seven seat form for the first time, but it's based on a monocoque platform like every Grand Cherokee before it. This is the flagship Summit Reserve variant, and its price of just over $115,000 makes it around 15,000 bucks cheaper than the Sahara. The Land Cruiser is powered by Toyota's first turbo diesel V6, and it brings more power, more torque, and better efficiency than the V8 turbo diesel it replaces, while still maintaining that 3,500 kilogram towing capacity. Sadly, Jeep has banished turbo diesel engines from the Grand Cherokee range, which means it gets a carryover 3.6 litre petrol V6. And while it generates similar power to the Toyota, it only musters up half the amount of torque, and that really hurts towing capacity. It'll only get around 2.3 tonnes of towing in this vehicle, and another thing, it's a lot thirstier too. The Toyota runs a 10-speed automatic transmission, the Jeep an 8-speed auto and both vehicles have full-time four-wheel drive systems, low-range transfer cases, and loads of easy-to-use off-road functionality. The Toyota Off-Roader's cabin is a huge improvement over its predecessor. I mean, you've got this beautiful big touchscreen, neatly integrated controls, and material quality is hugely improved wherever you touch. It just feels so much nicer than before. And this makes it feel less like a tractor and more like the kind of place you can sit back and relax all day or even all week. The seats are wide and supportive with eight way power adjustment and the leather quality is pretty good. They're also heated and cooled and the steering wheel is power adjustable too. Material quality is impressive overall, except for the fake wood inserts. Storage solutions are sufficient starting with large adjustable depth cup holders and a deep but narrow central bin that doubles as a cool box. There's little in the way of incidental storage, just a wireless phone charging pad that constantly sees the phone slide off and small door pockets. You get one USB-A and one USB-C port, but it feels like there's wasted space over here. The big 12.3 inch central touchscreen looks fantastic and the menu system is really easy to navigate. The only problem is there's just not a lot of menus. There's not a lot of depth here. Um, you know, you can do a few things like swap over the screen like that, but really there's not a lot going on. I kind of wish there was more detail for some of the systems. Um, that said, it is super quick to respond. I love that. You hit the button, bang, straight away. I really like that. Some systems you hit the button and it takes forever to load. That is good. There is a seven inch digital screen, but it's wedged between two analog dials, which makes the cockpit feel a bit old. I mean, most cars over $100,000 come with digital dials these days. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are included, as is a head up display, 14 speaker JBL stereo, and all the off-road functions are clustered in this one area and logically laid out. The reversing camera is so-so. Yes, you get the lovely wide view and the 360 degree overhead view on the left, but the resolution is pretty average and there's only two extra camera angles. There is this weird spinning 360 degree view, but there's no touch and drag functionality. You can only pause the spinning. The transparent car setting is pretty cool though. And while it's designed for off-roading, it helps when parking. Okay, into the Jeep, and 
Well, it's really suave. It's uh, far less truck-like than the Toyota, and it's got a much more luxurious ambience. The overall layout and design is classier, and it's backed up by higher quality materials. This is all really, really high-end stuff. And uh, I like the fact it's got a digital rear vision mirror too. The front seats are a little narrower in the Grand Cherokee, but the quilted Palermo leather is softer and feels more lavish. It matches the Toyota's heated and cooled seats, but ups the ante with 12-way power adjust and a back massage function. There are also real timber inlays on the dash and doors, and it has a more premium feel overall, but there is a sense the American SUV isn't bolted together quite as robustly as the Japanese one. The Jeep's incidental storage is on par with the Toyota's, and although it has bigger bottle holders in the door pockets, the twin cup holders and central bin are smaller. However, the wireless phone charger is more sensibly positioned, and it gets double the amount of USB-A and C ports. The Jeep's 10.1-inch digital screen is not as big as in the Toyota's, and it's not quite as quick to respond to touch, but it does have more depth, more functionality, and it looks better. There's more eye candy. And I like the fact that you can fine-tune all the driving assistance as well. That's pretty cool. A 12.3-inch digital driver's display adds a bit of razzle-dazzle and works effectively with an abundance of customizability. Oh, and this one even has night vision. The Jeep gets wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, where the Toyota requires cables, and a 19-speaker Macintosh stereo generates awesome acoustic quality, far better than the 14-speaker JBL Jobby of its rival. As far as the Jeep's off-road controls go, they're similarly clustered in one area, and likewise, there's not much difference between the head-up displays. But there is a fam cam, which will come in handy when the little blighters are bickering in the back seats. The reversing camera has a better resolution and far more camera angles to choose from as well. And there's even a camera cleaning function. Check this out. But like the Toyota, there's no drag and twist and drop to change the 3D camera angle. Bit of a bummer. The Jeep feels more sophisticated from the driver's seat and makes the Toyota feel slightly dated in some ways. For example, the analog instruments. But for all that, the Toyota still offers plenty of convenience and tech features and feels more, more solid overall. Both models cover all the basics and include most of the more advanced safety features available today. But the Land Cruiser pulls slightly ahead with 10 airbags versus the Jeep's eight. This is pretty swish back here in the Toyota. I wasn't expecting so much luxury. I mean, these form-fitting seats are just lovely. And the fact you get two entertainment screens is impressive. And they even come with individual headphone sockets and volume controls for left and right screens. Not bad. The back seats are heated and cooled. You've got dual zone automatic climate control, USB-C, HDMI, and 12 volt ports plus an armrest, cup holders, ISOFIX child seat anchorages, and a small sunroof. The third row seats are electrically adjustable, but they aren't exactly speedy. Righto, the Jeep. Well, the seats aren't quite as body-hugging, and there's not as much headroom due to the jumbo glass roof, but I like that you can slide the seats for more legroom. It misses out on entertainment screens, but the back seat still feels pretty special. You get the same dual-zone automatic climate control as the Toyota, and heated and cooled seats, but it has more USB ports and a conventional three pin power point. It also has window shades, plus the usual armrest, cup holders, and twin ISOFIX child seat anchorages. Both vehicles have seven seat provisions and both are electrically operated third row seats, but the Jeeps are a little bit quicker and they're also one touch. In the Land Cruiser, you have gotta hold down the button. Yawnsville. The Jeep also allows you to fold down every seat from the boot. The Land Cruiser does not. Cup holders, vents, and USB ports are available for third row occupants. But as we've seen throughout the rest of the car, the Jeep has more USB ports, and it also gets more headroom and adjustable legroom back there. Both cars have power operated tailgates, and both have huge boots. They're truly cavernous. You can fit pretty much anything in them, snowboards, surfboards, camping gear, prams, you name it. Um, I do like the fact that the Toyota has its three-pin PowerPoint back here. 
unlike the Jeeps, which is in the second row, because I mean, you're just gonna use things like portable fridges and appliances back here more than you are over there. You've also got four tie down points and a handy little light as well. The Jeep has a narrower but longer cargo space and has similar amenity to the Toyota. But one thing I'm not a huge fan of is the boot closing button is over here. So if the boot's full, it might be hard to get to. And I guess I'm just used to hitting a button up here. Both vehicles also have underslung spare tires. Toyota has a full size alloy spare. This is just a steel spare wheel. There's pros and cons for both cars thus far, but will it be a close call on the road as well? Time to cue the driving music. You really feel like king of the road in the Toyota Land Cruiser, and that's because it's a big unit with a tall body, and it gives you this high riding seating position. But it's still really relaxing to drive because everything is just so smooth. The V6 turbo diesel is beautifully refined and muscular, and it's surprisingly drivable around town. Despite the car's significant 2.5 tonne curb weight, it can really hustle when you sink in the boot. The closely spaced ratios of the 10-speed auto keeping things brisk when required. However, it's not the most dynamic SUV. When you turn a corner, the floppy suspension tends to list and wallow like a, like a small boat in stormy seas. The slow and vague steering exacerbates its ponderous handling dynamics and gives it a lethargic cornering feel. But a handy side effect of the soft suspension, which is tailored for off-roading, is that it floats over bumps and lumps. Yep, ride comfort is really good. The way it smooths out crummy road surfaces is remarkable. And refinement levels are quite impressive as well. There's not a lot of tire noise or engine noise, pretty much at any speed entering the cabin bad. Visibility for the most part is excellent for such a big unit, with large upright windows delivering good lines of sight all round. The only criticism is the big horizontal bonnet, which blunts low down vision. Right away the Jeep feels more car like to drive. It's quicker, more direct steering and firmer suspension make it easier to point the front end exactly where you want it. The petrol engine doesn't have the low end grunt of the Toyota's diesel, and while it's responsive to throttle input and works well at urban speeds, thanks in part to the savvy eight speed auto, the engine takes time to build up steam. When it comes to handling dynamics, the Jeep feels way more tied to the road. And even in comfort mode, it doesn't have the body roll or, or clumsiness of the Toyota. You don't need to fear roundabouts in this rig. Unlike the Toyota's passive suspension setup, the Jeep's adaptive shock absorbers and air suspension can adjust the car's firmness and ride height, delivering good ride comfort. But it can't match the cushy Toyota. That thing feels like a four-wheeled hovercraft. There's a little bit more noise intrusion into the cabin in the Jeep, through the engine, but also through the tires. Over speed bumps and potholes, those 21 inch alloy wheels and low profile tires really make themselves known. In terms of visibility, the sloping bonnet provides better forward vision than the Toyota's flat hood. And when you max out the air suspension, you feel untouchable, towering over surrounding traffic. But the windows are slimmer overall, which reduces lateral and rearward vision. All right, we've left the suburbs behind, we're on the open road, and right away, you can tell this car is a fantastic long distance cruiser. It eats up country miles like a champ. That 110 litre fuel tank giving it an excellent cruising distance. And the engine as well, that lusty V6 engine makes overtaking an absolute doddle. It's quiet and composed, and while not dynamically astounding, it's an easy and relaxing vehicle to drive over long distance. Back in the Jeep, and it's also very laid back and relaxing, and the autonomous steering function is definitely a little bit better. Um, also, those massaging seats are fantastic on longer cruises, but there are a couple of little issues. First, the 87 litre fuel tank. 
doesn't give you the same range as the Toyota. And also there's a little bit more tire and wind noise as well at 100 k's an hour. It's surprising how much quieter the Toyota is. On the open road where speed limits are higher, the V6 engine's nominal torque output sees it struggling to mobilize the vehicle's 2.3 ton mass with any conviction. Look, it sounds great when you drop the hammer, but its overtaking ability is inferior to the Toyota. Simply put, it needs more mumbo. I know the focus of this test is on-road driving, but it would be remiss of me not to test these big rigs on dirt roads, and unsurprisingly, the Toyota Land Cruiser is happy as a pig in shit. This is just so easy and effortless. The light steering, that absorbent suspension, it smashes through potholes with absolute ease, and it's just super predictable. It glides along and absorbs ruts and pothole gravel roads effortlessly, all the while delivering a level of predictability that adds confidence in all weather conditions. By comparison, the Jeep feels just as good on the gravel as the Toyota. It's got that same sure-footedness and there is a predictability that makes it easy to burn around on dirt roads and you've got confidence too. The air suspension does a great job and the added bonus of being able to max out the ride height is pretty handy in challenging situations. But the big 21 inch alloy wheels means you feel a few more bumps than in the Land Cruiser and there's way more tyre noise too. In terms of fuel efficiency, the trip computers reckon the Jeep is on par with the Toyota. But after measuring fuel use from the Bowser, the Toyota diesel's huge reserves of torque and understressed engine give it the edge. Despite its car-like response and impressive handling dynamics, the Jeep doesn't have the appeal of Toyota. On balance, the Land Cruiser is more appealing to drive. In terms of running costs, the Toyota will almost certainly be more affordable in the long run, despite its more expensive asking price and more frequent service intervals. That's because it has excellent retained value, and Toyota's reputation for building bulletproof vehicles is virtually unmatched in the automotive world. The new Jeep Grand Cherokee L is a beautifully executed luxury SUV with impressive attention to detail. It's a far more premium vehicle than before and it makes the Land Cruiser feel a bit beige in some respects. It's bigger than Texas with a massive boot and is loaded to the gunnels with technology. And while the Jeep feels more car-like to drive and, and less roly-poly, the Toyota's cabin luxury and advanced technology is not miles off the pace. The Land Cruiser also feels more solid from the way the heavy set doors thud closed to how it's bolted together. Improved safety credentials, smooth ride, and a vastly superior engine make it a very good daily driver and a brilliant adventure machine for weekend warriors. Even so, this battle is much closer than I thought it would be. And yes, the Toyota Land Cruiser is an improved urban warrior for sure, and it's upped its game across all key metrics. But so has the Jeep. Ultimately though, the Toyota is where I would put my money.